an expert in digital security and privacy who has strategically advised governments and the press on how best to combat disinformation and propaganda. Christopher DeFore uses his deep knowledge to help us stay a step ahead of the bad guys in a rapidly changing world. At a time when digital threats come from all sides, individuals, governments, and corporations, consumers need all the information they can get to protect themselves. We are fortunate to have him today as our guest. I'm Ware Wendell, and this is Christopher DeFore in Conversation. Christopher DeFore, thank you for joining us on End Conversation. Hey, thank you. Happy to be here. And you are joining us from my hometown of Fort Worth. And just right off the top here, in full disclosure, you and I have known one another and been friends for almost 30 years at this point. It's painful to think about how long that is. But yes, yes, we have. <laughs> <laughs> well, as the line goes in the movie, in that time, Chris, you have uh, you have developed a very particular set of skills uh, as it relates to digital privacy and security and open source intelligence. How did you get into this into this field? I mean, it's a very niche field that you're in. Uh, I, I kind of feel like like everything that has happened to me, good in my life, I fell backwards into it uh, completely by accident. Um, Originally, my background was in social media marketing, advertising, and that was that was all stuff that I picked up on my own as well, like uh, like learning how to build a website on WordPress and understanding what search engine optimization was. The thing that you don't really think about, or at least we didn't back in the early 2000s when these technologies and these systems were becoming freely available to people, were the security aspects of it. So over the course of, of the last 20 years, um, I spent more and more time unpacking, wow, what did I actually get into when I signed up for Facebook, Twitter, Foursquare, et cetera. Uh, and then really realizing that, wow, I've, I've surrendered quite a bit of information about myself that I didn't need to do uh, as a result of my interactions online. Oh, definitely. It's a, it's a, it's a rapidly changing world that we're living in these days. It's, it's exciting, but it can be a little scary as well. I know that you've worked with a number of different organizations with the media, you've worked with the government as well. You may be limited in what you can say about your government work, but to the extent that, that you can talk about that work, we'd love to hear about some of the projects that you've worked on through the years. For sure, yeah. Uh, you mentioned open source intelligence and uh, I had, uh, I had the, the pleasure of working with a, with a company uh, about seven, eight years ago, designing one of the very first OSINT uh, qualification and certification courses. Um, so what we did was the idea was to take uh, zero to hero, anybody that had even the most basic or rudimentary of digital skills and turn them into experts in two weeks, uh, beginning with understanding one's own digital footprint and then expanding from there into all of the capabilities that you could use to find something out on the internet, whether it's uh, you know a bunch of data from Twitter inside a social network analysis graph, uh, or using other types of domain tools to figure out where an IP address uh, uh, resolves back to. So that that uh, nothing like that had ever been done before uh, at the scale that we pulled it together. So we were specifically looking at outcomes for the special operations community, for federal, local, and state law enforcement, uh, but also for Fortune, you know, 150 companies that had security problems, uh, folks that were looking at building new pipelines or new factories or new new uh, assets in various parts of the world and wanted to understand what the, the potential threats and problems might be for the places that they were going. Uh, the great thing about the internet is that, is that if, you, if you know how to ask the right question, you can find all kinds of stuff. So that was really what we were doing, uh, especially over the last seven, eight years, uh, was figuring out new ways of doing that, but also kind of understanding what the ethical implications of looking at that data was. Because in some cases, you can, you can find a hacked database with all kinds of uh, email, uh, you know, email addresses or, or physical addresses or other things, but depending on who you are and what you're doing, should you even be looking at that in the first place? And that became a bigger question than, than just being able to do those things uh, uh, as time went on. 
Oh, definitely. And for our audience, when you say open source intelligence, this is the information that we freely give up about ourselves. We may not understand that we're communicating that range of information, but, but this is the stuff that's just out there through our presence online. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. So if you think about open source as publicly available data, anything that, that could possibly be accessed publicly, uh, open source intelligence or OSINT is also a term that's been adopted by the hacker community as ways of harvesting that publicly available information uh, in whatever way possible. And depending on, again, on who you are, who you work for, what your, your desired outcome happens to be, OSINT can be used for you know, noble purposes like protecting oneself and protecting one's brand or assets, uh, but it, it can also be used for nefarious purposes. Oh, and these days you're an independent consultant. You help organizations that need to kind of understand what their footprint is and help them with some tune-ups. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I spend a lot of time with folks uh, uh, doing the hard work of understanding, uh, you know, where my vulnerabilities happen to be, uh, but also very simple things like some, you know, short trainings to understand how you can, how you can learn how to, how to self-teach yourself over time so that you're not you're not always caught off guard by the latest change in a terms of service or a new technology or a tool that comes out. So I want to focus this conversation today on, on digital privacy and, and security, the threats that we face as consumers out there just kind of moving through the world in our day-to-day -day life. So let's start by talking about the threats and some of the actors who are out there who, who may uh, want to do us harm, whether it's individuals uh, crime outfits or organizations, uh, corporations. So talk about what we're looking at, Chris, when, when we look at the threat assessment. I mean, it's, it, it's across the spectrum, right? Uh, I think folks generally think about what, what is it that I have at risk um, when, they're, uh, when they're trying to understand who is it that's stealing my data or my information. Um, it's relatively easy to get credit card numbers, uh, all of the all of the associated information that you would need a credit card number to work with. Um, I, I want to say that the last time I looked at, at certain dark web deposits where you'd go and buy identities with credit card numbers attached to them, they were only going for like six bucks at a time. Um, uh, you know, and adjusted because it's so easy. I mean, it's it's really really simple. You know, from card skimmers on uh, on on gas pumps all the way up to the really hard stuff of, of complex social engineering attacks through email and things. Um, so, so is that necessarily mean that, that that's the entire government of China that's coming after your credit card? Eh, I mean, sometimes, I mean, you know, if it gets hoovered up in some, you know, in a, in a larger database of, of credit card information, possibly. Uh, China's got bigger fish to fry though, uh, at, at governmental and in some cases societal levels, which you see in, in larger disinformation campaigns. So does that sometimes translate into hard hacking? Yeah. Uh, we're seeing more though at the, at the state and national level, I think more of a, 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 a focus on digital disinformation and deception. So it's easier to get somebody to do something uh, by convincing them that what they're looking at online is emotionally resonant in some form, meaning that it makes you angry. So instead of investigating it further, uh, you end up clicking on a button to share. And in some cases, clicking on that button surrenders information about your computer or it downloads a piece of malware. I don't know. Um, so we're, we're not just seeing that from China. It's all over the, it's all over the place. You know, Russia, Iran have capabilities like that. Uh, every, just about every country does at this point. So, so looking at things from a state actor level, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a Texan just kind of going to work every day, um, it's, it's not something that you should necessarily be afraid of all the time. There are ways to, to protect yourself against that, which I think you should on, on, on any level. Uh, but the, the real threats are when you start thinking about things like ransomware, uh, which, is a, which is unfortunately a, a security threat that involves someone downloading a program onto your computer and then locking you out of it unless you pay them money. So they're holding your, your computer for ransom. We've seen attacks like this uh, through sheriff's departments in the country, uh, several different companies, in which case they actually just pay the ransom to get access to their thing again. And the reason that that happens is because, again, usually about 90% of the time, someone clicked on a link in an email uh, that they shouldn't have, that they thought that they trusted, and unfortunately they didn't. And that's, that is a digital technique called social engineering uh, and phishing. 
So a subject that I'm seeing more and more about in the press is, is co corporate surveillance, basically. We work a lot on insurance issues at Texas Watch, protecting policyholders. And I don't know how many people are aware of how often insurance companies are using that open source information. It could be posts that you're putting up on your social media channels for either claims investigation or even underwriting. So when they're deciding, are we gonna offer coverage to this person or how are we gonna price that coverage? I'm seeing articles about that with life insurance companies, for instance. What can you tell us about corporate surveillance, the people who are out there and the companies that are out there hoovering up that information as you put it earlier? Uh, well, yeah, so think about it like this, is in, this, is, this has been the, 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 the root of the problem of the internet for the longest time is if you put something online, whatever that happens to be, your name, a photo, uh, whatever it is, that data is now public. Someone can get access to it. No matter how many privacy controls you put on it, no, no matter how many security aspects, something is gonna change at some point and someone will get access to that data if they want it bad enough. So when we talk about this in aggregate, particularly in the insurance industry, the insurance industry has got the money to spend on large big data analytics tools that do that hoovering, right? So that they go up and they get access to your LinkedIn, your Facebook, whatever it happens to be. Um, because one of the things that they're trying to do is use that public data to verify claims in some cases, uh, but they're also using it to determine whether or not, and you know, to cover somebody like you're saying. Um, it, that, that, is that ethical? Maybe, uh, you know, again, if, if you're putting information out anywhere on the internet and it doesn't cost you anything, you are a product your information and your data becomes a product. That means that the, the service that on which you're putting your data is taking that information and they're selling it to somebody else. And it could be an insurance company. Uh, it could be an analytics company. There are, there are certain co uh, uh, companies out there that make giant software that analyze all types of different public uh, information in aggregate. So uh, they can use this for all kinds of purposes from surveillance uh, i.e., you know, what protest happens to be going on down the street and who's involved. Uh, we've seen some articles about that from, from different companies. Uh, but again, to, to kind of root it back to the average consumer, every time you interact with the internet, whether it's through your phone, the desktop, whatever it happens to be, if you touch the internet or an internet enabled app or service, you are surrendering some of that data somewhere that someone can then hoover up at some point. So in this interview series, we really focus on issues related to justice. So let's talk about how we can protect ourselves, how we can keep ourselves from being harmed. Um, I mean, I think we all know that we probably need, not probably, we definitely need an antivirus software package, but there's a thousand of them out there and they all say that they're the best. So I wanna take this time to, to really pick your brain and see what your recommendations are because you're spending all of your time thinking about this and researching this. So when you're I mean, you get the pop-up hey download this uh, antivirus it's it's free should you do that should you pay more to get a different antivirus software talk to talk to our audience about what they should be doing to protect their computers uh so if, if you're getting something for free it's not working uh that's that's generally seems to be the consensus of the security community uh like anything that you should buy don't just buy the first thing that pops up do do your own research uh, a great resource for everybody to use out there is a website called securityplanner.org. Uh, securityplanner.org recently got uh, hoovered up by um, uh, Consumer Reports, and it's a really great website that helps you think through all of the digital security options that you might need, whether it's an antivi antivirus package, whether it's a VPN, uh, different types of privacy-focused browsers. Uh, and the reason why I recommend that as a starting point for folks is because one thing is not going to make you perfectly secure. It just doesn't exist. There's not, a, there's not a silver bullet for perfect digital security. The way that you get great at it is by building good habits. By, and, and those are built upon sometimes good technologies. Um, running a VPN, both on your desktop and on your mobile phone, very important. Um, but remember, every time that you use a VPN and then you log into something, if you're using login credentials, um, you've just told whatever you've logged into that you're using a VPN. And in some cases, that becomes an identifying piece of information that then gets aggregated with other pieces of information about so, you. Let's break that down. What is a VPN and why a is VPN it important? Is a, 
Yeah, a VPN is a virtual private network. Essentially what it is is that when you turn it on, your computer looks like it is working off of the network of the VPN itself, okay? So instead of your local network, like right now, I could, uh, if I connect to a Wi-Fi down the street, it's gonna come up as coming in Fort Worth, Texas. And in some cases, people can use the IP address, the specific numbers of where that network is connecting to the internet. Uh, they can use that to determine my location. So one of the things that, that is great about VPN is that it obscures your location. It gives you the ability to choose egress points like let's say if I didn't want to look like I was coming from Texas at all, I could turn my VPN on and select an egress point in New York City. Uh, and then that way it looks like all of my activity is attributable to New York City and not necessarily Fort Worth. That's what a VPN does for you. Gotcha. In terms of browsers, are there browsers that you like? Are there capabilities that you should, that you should be looking for when you're, uh, when you're deciding on a browser? Should you have multiple browsers? Yeah, on your that's the best practice is use different browsers for different purposes. Um, uh, I, I am a big fan of Firefox. Uh, one of the things that Security Planner will do for you is kind of go through which browsers are available and, and how to configure them in such a way so that you're not leaking information. Uh, so sometimes what happens is you download your browser and you go to a website, you click on a couple of things. Well, everything that you're doing on that website is a piece of data that the website can, can, can collect about your behavior or your activity. Uh, and then that gets served up to uh, ad networks to serve ads back to you. So the way that you harden your browser will prevent that from happening. Some cases, people don't care about that. They like getting ads that are very, you know, very tailored to who they are and their interests and that type of stuff. But what you don't know is where that ad network is selling that data on the back end to. Um, uh, if anyone wants to, to, to see how wrong that can go, you should look into some of the business practices for Cambridge Analytica before that company folded up a while ago. Um, ad networks and ad data is vastly unregulated in the United States. And as a result of that, we don't always know what our data is, is, is being done with after we see it. So we have to be careful about that or, or not, right? So this is part of, part of the, the, the question for yourself is understanding what, you know, what's your risk tolerance to some of this stuff. Browsers are great starts. Um, I would recommend uh, never using Internet Explorer ever again. If you have it, um, avoid it like the plague. Uh, I, again, I kind of mentioned I'm a big fan of Firefox. There's also another privacy focused browser out there called Brave. Uh, Brave is a really good one. You just turn it on and it rocks and rolls. A lot oh, of folks. I've been, I've been hearing about that one. Yeah, Brave's pretty good. Um, it, it, it breaks websites quite a bit. Uh, and sometimes you'll go to a website and like, it doesn't look like the website that I usually go to. And it's because Brave's privacy controls or its JavaScript settings are already been pre-configured to be as secure as possible. So you got to go through and kind of monkey with it. It's a little bit, a little bit more technical than, uh, than just downloading, you know, a, a Firefox or something like that. Uh, I will say that that uh, Chrome uh, is something to think about. Yeah, it's a great browser. A lot of people use it. Uh, one of the things that you're going to kind of root this back to what you had mentioned about corporate surveillance and corporate, uh, you know, surveillance capitalism. Chrome is part of the Google empire. And one of the reasons that's a billion dollar company is because its products are baked into your life at some point. And Chrome is one of those products. Um, out of the box, that thing is collecting information on you all the time. Uh, and I know a lot of security experts that wear tinfoil hats that say, not on my computer. Um, so something to be, be aware of. Very interesting. We spend so much of our lives on our phones these days. I mean, they're, they're, they're an appendage at this point. What are some things that we can do to harden our phones from a, from a privacy and security standpoint? Uh, I would, well, I would, I'd go back to VPNs, of course, you know, you can get a really good paid VPN plan. Um, that includes multiple devices. Uh, I, you know, there's a lot of different ones that are out there. I encourage you to do your own research and figure out which ones are, are the best. There's tons of websites. Wirecutter is a good one that actually ranks which VPN is great. Um, but stay on top of uh, what that particular VPN provider, what their corporate infrastructure looks like. I used to be a big fan of one called Private Internet Access, PIA. It was super cheap. You could get a deal on it for two or three years, put it on multiple devices, use it on your whole family. Ran great, awesome performance, had egress points, like 50 different egress points all over the planet. Uh, and then an Israeli firm bought it out uh, last year, an Israeli firm that had a reputation for building malware and malvertising. 
Uh, and that sounded a little sketchy. I'm not sure I wanted a company like that having access to uh, servers on which that, you know, I was presumably secure. So I don't use that anymore. Um, but there's a lot of them that are out there that are not like that. So, you know, do, do the research, use your security planner to figure that out. Um, mobile security is really difficult because of all of the things that is the one that most companies from advertisers and marketers to product owners are trying their hardest to get you to open up. Um, so if you have the option for turning your location services off, turn it off. Um, in some cases, you can't do that. Android devices, uh, you can only take them so far uh, because baked into the operating system is a tiny little clause in the terms of service that says, even though you've turned your location services off, Google is still collecting information about where you are. Um, one of the interesting pivots recently in the mobile world has been Apple taking a very hard stance on user security and privacy. Uh, we've seen some new tools that they've rolled out into their operating systems about letting you know which apps are using your location actively. Um, that's a pretty good step in the right direction. It's not perfect. I mean, Apple is still collecting information on you about where you go and everything. Um, but, uh, but think about that. Now, you know, what, what, uh, you know, what is, what does your device know about you? You know, where does it go? It can actually pinpoint where you are down to about, you know, less than a meter accuracy. So think about how uh, all the places that you go and how you interact with stuff. Just, just think about all of that pattern of life being sellable to someone or an organization that might want to do something nefarious for you. So when it comes to mobile, mobile security, I would say, go back to that securityplanner.org, go through the, the options there, maybe use a different, uh, maybe use a different browser on your phone than you would on your desktop. Don't keep, uh, uh, don't keep bookmarks. Don't stay logged into things. I know that's a pain in the butt. Um, but, uh, but that's the best way to remain as secure as possible. You've spent a lot of your career teaching governments and others how to combat disinformation and propaganda. And at Texas Watch, we're always doing everything we can to get the very best information to the public so they can fight for their rights. I think that it's very important to give people all the source documents. For instance, if we're talking about a bill uh, at the Texas legislature, it's not just what I say the bill does. I want people to see the bill themselves. They can read it for themselves, make up their own mind as to the effect that it would have but we're being deluged with, with memes and, and all sorts of very sophisticated attacks. I think of this as political hacking, if you will, whether it's from people here within the United States or from overseas that are trying to steer us in certain directions. So what can we do to combat that political hacking? How can we vet this information? How can we decide that this is truthful and this is information that we should act upon? Think critically at all times. Um, everything that you see on the internet is being served up to you in some form or fashion based on your behavior or your location or things that you've said, like what political party you belong to or what issues uh, are important, or because you've led a bunch of tweets out that say these things really, really tick me off. Um, so remember all of that information, we're, we're, we're back into what's public and what's not. All that information is going somewhere that somebody can buy access to and then use for this digital influence ecosystem, whatever the outcome happens to be, whether it's voting one way or the other, uh, whether it's going and joining a protest or something, uh, or whether it's giving money to a certain organization. So, so that is the nature of digital influence is that more than ever, it is super, super easy for organizations and, and even individuals to influence people to do certain things. And one of the best ways to do that is by using misinformation or disinformation. Uh, that is emotionally rooted. So one of the things that I, t I always tell people is, is when you're looking at something and you're about to take action or share an article, um, why are you sharing it? Is it, it? Did it cause outrage within you? Well, that should be an indicator that maybe that information needs a little bit more vetting before you share it. Uh, try and find the original poster or the original source of the information that you're looking at. Uh, track it back. Don't just accept that uh, the source that you're looking at is a real source or a true source. Uh, I really, really dislike the term fake news. Um, uh, I think it's I think it's misleading uh, because what is news these days, but also uh, in some cases, some of the best news that's out there, some of the best disinformation that's out there always has a grain of truth attached to it. Um, so, you know, don't don't immediately listen to somebody who's saying that site or that source is fake news. Look into it for yourself. 
uh, spend time talking to folks uh, and don't reflexively share stuff because that puts you as part of the viral disinformation ecosystem at that point. So take time to dig. And, um, and if it makes sense to you at that point, then yes, share it, but, but don't just do it un unconsciously or without critical thought. Agreed. So we're doing the right thing by giving people the source information. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I think original sources that can be verified uh, and independently corroborated, uh, you know, be a journalist, be a, be a, don't just be a consumer of your favorite journalist source. Remember the thing that journalists and intelligence officers do across the world is corroborate something, or at least they're supposed to. Uh, so be that journalist, be the person that's corroborating something before you take action upon it. Gotcha. I know that you said there's no silver bullet on any of this, but if you could give someone just some top tips, one or two, and then for those who want to dive deeply on this, some resources for, for further study and action as we wrap up, Chris. Uh, again, I'm, I'll, I'll, I've said it a couple times and I'll say it again, that securityplanner.org is a really good starting point. Um, uh, it, it's a good starting point. You'll answer a couple of questions about the things that you that, that matter to you. So what, what types of information do you want to protect? Uh, is it just you and your household? Are there other people? Um, uh, your, do, does your organization have security policies that maybe you want to adopt at home? Uh, remember, it's not just necessarily individual security. There's also, uh, you know, I can try as much as I want to not to put a photo of myself on Facebook, but if someone snaps a photo of me and puts it up there, I can't stop them. Uh, it's, it's, it's really difficult to do that. So, you know, one of the things that, that you have to think about is not just your digital security, but your physical security as well. Um, you know, use complex passwords, use a password manager, uh, you know, two-factor authentication. All of these, all of these tips are out there. They've been talked about by security folks and even mainstream news for a long time. Uh, they are good tips for a reason. Uh, there's, there's nothing that I can tell you that you wouldn't have already heard before. And you'll notice when you get into that security planner website and kind of go through it, um, a lot of the suggestions will seem familiar to you. Follow them. Just, just do what it says, and you will be much, much more secure. Um, if it seems like it, like it is, it is difficult, like it is overwhelming. That's okay. It is. Uh, you've got to remember that the the digital enterprise that we live in right now got so big, so fast that nobody ethically thought about what this is doing to us as humans. So one of the things that we've got to do is slow down. Slow down a little bit and just ask yourself, am I really protecting what I should be protecting? Have I, have I totally secured myself with this app that I'm downloading onto my phone or what have you? Um, those are the best suggestions that I can give anybody. Uh, and and uh, sometimes it takes a, a couple of stumbles and before you build the good habits. And that's one of the things that I admire about Aristotle. He said, good behavior is not just good. Uh, it's because you build a habit into it. So, you know, build those habits. Most definitely. Chris, thank you for helping us make sense of this world that's spinning so so quickly these days. I really appreciate all of your insights and your time. And thank you for joining us on End Conversation. You bet. Thanks for having me, Where I appreciate it. Anytime.